And good morning, everyone. It is good to see you all as always. And I'm grateful to Dorothy and Harold for that beautiful prelude and to Wesley, for those of you who were on before the prelude um, to see his beautiful painting that you will see again on some of our other slides. So welcome to worship at Cleveland Park Congregational UCC. We're an open and affirming congregation and whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We love having visitors and invite you to tell us who you are and where you're from. Just click the visitor link that I'm about to put in the chat room and I'll send you an email. Given the frosty temperatures in DC this morning, you may enjoy knowing that in many ancient Northern hemisphere traditions, this week, or I should say this past week, is considered a harbinger of spring. February 2nd is exactly halfway between the winter solstice and spring equinox. Thus Candlemas, Groundhog Day, Imbolc, and St. Bridget's Day, to name a few, are all celebrated on that date for this reason. In our church, as the snowdrops bloom and the planet turns inexorably toward the sun, we're looking forward to a resumption of hybrid worship in March. This means those of you who would like to worship in person are welcome in the sanctuary, assuming you're vaccinated and masked. And those who would like to continue participating via Zoom are very welcome to do that. As a reminder this morning, please make sure your devices are muted. And if you don't have your video turned on or we can't see everyone in your household, Use the chat room to tell us how many people, adults and children, are viewing the service. Bruce, our brand new moderator, will share the announcements. Let me get rid of the mute first. Hold on a moment. Good morning, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here on my first Sunday morning as the new moderator. And as we prepare, as uh, Pastor Ellen said, to return to hybrid worship, the music committee would like to invite you to make a musical contribution to our Sunday services. This could be vocal, instrumental, solo, small group, whatever you'd like. If interested, please contact Sarah Spey and her email is in the chat room. As February is Black History Month, and you are invited to participate in a UCC Potomac Association discussion of Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis's new book, Fierce Love, beginning this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Lewis is the first female Black senior minister at the historic Collegiate Churches of New York, and her book has been called A Healing Antidote to Our Divisive Culture. These virtual discussions will take place over three Wednesday evenings, and you can register via the link in the chat room. All children and families are invited to participate in making secret Valentines for the congregation members next Saturday. That's February 12th at 11. We'll gather in the church parlor with masks on and windows open. So dress warmly. <laughs> next Sunday, also February 13th, Pastor Ellen will lead a visitor session after worship. So if you've been attending our worship services and would like to learn more about our congregation, please join her. RSVP to her email in the chat room. And later this afternoon, that afternoon, excuse me, right before the Super Bowl, you're invited to join the fellowship committee for a tea in the garden, excuse me, in the church parlor from 4 to 5.30. This is a wonderful opportunity for those who are vaxxed and boosted to gather in person. We'll use the church china and have fans on, windows open, and air purifiers running. Last but not least, our congregation is participating in a multi-church worship service hosted by People's UCC on Saturday, February 26th at 5. This Jazz Vespers will honor Black History Month with Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis preaching and everyone is invited. You can register to attend this in person via the link in the chat room or participate online at peopleschurchucc.org. There are some additional uh, announcements that I invite you to read in the order of service. And now back to Pastor Ellen. 
Thank you so much, Bruce. I appreciate that. It's good to welcome you as moderator. And I will just add that we will share communion later in the service. So if you'd like to get some food and beverage for that, you're most welcome. We begin this morning's worship by lighting our candle of hope and healing for the world. Our service today will focus on miracles every day and out of this world. Please join me for the call to worship. I tell you, there are more things in heaven and earth than we can imagine. God is so much bigger than our understanding. And now please join me for our opening prayer as we pray together. Oh God, you are miracle and mystery, philosophy and prose. You show up in the daily and overwhelm us with all that is. Open our minds to everything this magical world has to offer. Give us glimpses of the pattern beneath the puzzle. Grace us with the ability to notice the sparkling shards, even in that which has broken. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn, Morning Has Broken. broken like the first morning blackbird has spoken like the first bird praise for the singing praise for the morning praise for them springing fresh from
And of course that song was written by Eleanor Fargian, but um, in my opinion, Cat Stevens sings the best version ever. I now invite you to join in a time of silent reflection. When we gather for worship, we heed God's call and honor our need for Sabbath and rest. When we enter into silence, we attune our hearts and open our minds to a presence greater than our own. As we begin this short period of meditation, I encourage you to bring your full self to this present moment. Set aside any distractions, lay down your burdens and take a deep life-giving breath. God is with us. Let us reflect upon the week that has passed. What are the joys we have celebrated? And what concerns have we endured? Are there things we have done that we ought not to have done? And are there things we have left undone that we ought to have done. As we look forward to the week ahead, what help will we need from God or neighbor? And what can we do to nurture love of God and love of neighbor in the world? We'll close in prayer source of life, for the joys we have celebrated, we give you thanks. God of compassion, for the concerns we have endured, please tend our hearts. Spirit of justice, for those things we have misdone, transform us with your love. 
companion God. As we look forward to the week ahead, be ever present with us. And great lover of all, as we seek to nurture love of God and neighbor in the world, guide our actions and our prayers. Amen. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus invites all of us to come to him, no matter what burdens we're carrying and no matter how tired we are. And so I repeat his words, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Rest and be assured that through the grace and love of God, we are all, each one of us, forgiven. No matter what we have done or left undone, we are forgiven by the awesome and redemptive power of God's great mercy and love. Now held in the arms of this God, who is both father and mother, we pray together the prayer of Jesus, our brother. And as we do on Communion Sundays, we'll share a different version of the Lord's Prayer. Eternal Spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by all people of the world. May your heavenly will be done by all created beings. May your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and may it come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and testing, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. I now invite you all to unmute and share the peace and love of God with each other. Peace be with you all. Peace be with you. Good morning. Peace be with everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi there. So good to see all these friendly faces. I love it. Hi, Ed Rowe. Hi. Nancy's saying hi. Big hug and a big kiss. <laughs> Wonderful to see all of you. And you'll notice that we don't have Nick's special screen up today because he's crazy. That special Olympic skiing. Oh, yes. My goodness. <laughs> I hope Nick, I hope Mark's taking lots of photos, Elf. Oh, I'm sure he will. <laughs> where where is the Special Olympics being held? Uh, well, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's, it's the special Olympics program. So it's um, oh, here still doing skiing training. So they're up at whitetail. Um, yeah. oh, good. That's that great. They, yeah. There'll be the sort of like big competition, I think at the end of February. So I'm sure Nick will keep you posted. Good, where, good, is good. White, where is whitetail, Helen? 
Uh, Whitetail, anybody help help me, folks? Anybody? <laughs> I mean, Maryland, Virginia, West Virginia. West Virginia, I think. I think West it's West Virginia. Yeah, as you know, Mom, I can tell In you. Pennsylvania. What. Pennsylvania. Whoa. Okay. I know nothing about local skiing. I can tell you where the ski areas are in Montana. <laughs> uh, <yeah>. So can we. <laughs> All right. Let's remute and we'll share our peace prayer with, prayer with one another. First, placing our hands on our heart, then repeating after me. May peace and health be with me. May peace and health be with this congregation. May peace and health be with our city and our country. May peace and health be with this entire world. Amen. All right, so let's see. I see Zachary is with me this morning. And let's see, do we have any other children who are with us this morning? No, nobody else this morning. Zachary, it's, oh, Noah, yes, yay. Okay, so I'm going to, um, let's see, let me first put it on speaker view. And then I am going to add my friends, Noah and Zachary. And if I'm missing anybody, you're just gonna unmute and um, I'm gonna unmute and let me know. All right, let's see. Here we go. Add a spotlight and then I'll go back to myself and add myself in. And actually it's probably a good idea that it's the three of us because um, I know that both of you are readers and um, probably movie watchers. And so I'm wondering if either of you have read or had read to you or watched the movie or book, Charlotte's Web. Yeah, okay, Noah has. Zachary, have you read the book or seen the movie Charlotte's Web? No, that's totally fine. It's about a pig named Wilbur. You have, okay, all right. I just had to sort of bring it up, right? So there's the pig named Wilbur and then the spider's name is? Charlotte. There you go, Charlotte's Web, right? And in this story, there's a miracle that happens. Do you remember what it is? Uh, no. Well, some really odd things happen with that web. Do you remember? I forget. It was a long time ago. Quite all right. It turns out that Charlotte is a writer. Does that help out? And so she uses her web to write things when Wilbur is at the state fair and his little friend, is her name Fern, I think? His little friend Fern is very, very worried that he is going to be sold for pork. But Charlotte, his friend, with a little help from Templeton the Rat, actually writes three different messages on a web over the stall where he's being held in the barn at the fair. I can't remember exactly what all three of them are, but I know one was good pig. Now, as you can imagine, this called all, caused all sorts of ruckus and hullabaloo, right? But in the end, Wilbur goes back home to the farm with Fern. So some people would say, well, the miracle is that Charlotte was able to write those three messages on the web. But at the end of the book, the real miracle is, you wanna venture a guess? The real miracle, oh, go ahead, you wanna try? 
You're muted, what? Zach. You're saying something. Oh, is Noah? That listened. That what? Sorry. That they listened. Absolutely, that people listened. Definitely. But that Charlotte had babies. Charlotte did have babies, so that Wilbur was going to have more friends. Yeah. At the end of the book, the real miracle is their friendship. It's their friendship. And even naughty little Templeton, his friendship that saved Wilbur's life. So sometimes the real miracle isn't the flashy thing, right? Up on the marquee with the glittering dew on the web. Sometimes the real miracle is just the connections between all of us. So there's a wonderful song from that movie called Ordinary Miracles. And I thought it might be fun to watch it right now. Do you think? I'll do that. Hey, I just wanted to say when I was four, I dressed as one of the babies for Halloween. One of one of Charlotte's spider babies? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. I think I plan was it did, didn't I plan out what didn't I plan it out all myself? Well when you built it. Yeah, you, 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 yeah, it was the train costume that you really planned out, but you also planned out the spider costume. Yeah. yeah. So you had a vision and your mom executed it. Is that right? Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So let's check out, let's check this video out. I'm going to take off your spotlights. Thank you so much for helping me remember the details of Charlotte's Web. And here we go. Enjoy. It's not that unusual When everything is beautiful It's just another ordinary miracle today The sky knows when it's time to snow Don't need to teach a seed to grow It's just another ordinary is like a gift they say wrapped up for you every day open up and find a way give some of your own isn't it remarkable like every time a raindrop falls it's just another Oh. 
That song just makes me happy. Let's remember all of the ordinary miracles. And now Trish is going to share with us a reading from the prof prophet Ezekiel and from the Gospel of Luke. Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 4 to 5a and 22 through 28. As I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continuously. And in the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. Over the heads of the living creatures, there was something like a dome shining like crystal spread out above their heads. Under the dome, their wings were stretched out straight one toward another, and each of the creatures had two wings covering its body. When they moved, I heard the sound of their wings, like the sound of mighty waters, like the thunder of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stopped, they let down their wings, and there came a voice from above the dome over their heads. When they stopped, they let down their wings. And above the dome, over their heads, there was something like a throne, an appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was something that seemed like a human form. Heard from what appeared like the loins, I saw something gl that gleaming like amber, something that looked like fire enclosed all around. And downward from what looked like the loins, I saw something that looked like fire and there was splendor all around. Like the bow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendor all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of someone speaking. And now Luke. Once, while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Genseret and the crowd was press pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for the catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet, if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. Thank you so much, Trish. Every Wednesday morning, a dozen of us gather via Zoom for meditation. We focus on our breath, relax our bodies, and engage in Lexio Divina, a form of contemplative prayer focused on a passage of scripture or other reading, often poetry. We listen to the Lexio three times, open to whatever word or phrase might speak to us, and then settle in for 10 minutes of silence. Any of you is welcome to join us. This week's reading came from Donna Fald's book of poetry, Go In and In, a poem called Nothing is Impossible. I tell you, this was no ordinary rainbow. It stretched low and wide, the spectrum reaching inside the mountain, tickling the tops of trees with indigo and red. I gaped and laughed and leapt. I tell you, it was something, this rainbow, and I took it for a sign. A sign of what, you ask? That nothing is impossible, I answer that gladiolas can shoot up through a blue Persian rug, 
that the stars in Orion's belt can join a rhythm and blues band that squirrels can count change at the basketball game. And grapefruits as big as bowling balls can roll into the kitchen in time for tomorrow's breakfast. I tell you, this was no run of the mill rainbow. It is with me still. It's promise steering me clear of whatever passes for normality around here. Whatever passes for normality around here. I love this line. I mean, what is normality or for that matter, miracle or mystery? In this morning's reading from the prophet Ezekiel, we get a mystic vision replete with winged beasts, celestial lights, gleaming amber, and a rainbow. In what's known as a theophany, God appears to Ezekiel, overwhelming him with glory so he knows to take seriously whatever God is going to say. Poor Ezekiel. He's 30 years old and his family has already been exiled from Judah to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. Now he must deal with this crazy vision and wonder if it's really God or if he just has an overactive imagination. And if it really was God, he must tell the Hebrew people they'd better get their act together if they ever want to return to Israel. Then again, I suppose with a task that difficult, an otherworldly theophany was necessary. Note that it's quite different from the other story of extraordinary events Trish read. In the vignette from Luke's gospel, Jesus meets some of his first followers, fishermen, before he calls them to be his disciples. In this reading, no one has a mystic vision. There are no sapphire dreams. Just after a night catching absolutely no fish, the men drop their nets based on Jesus' word and haul up an unbelievably large catch. Miracle? Perhaps. But nothing flashy to be sure. We're talking fish. So what is a miracle? And what a mystic vision? And is God accessible or ultimate mystery? Just a few easy questions. I think one of the most compelling aspects of Jesus, whether you view him as God himself or a messenger of God, is his approachability. Once we get past the nativity story with its angel choirs and visiting kings, there's really no pretense. I mean, you can't really compare the voice of God in the clouds at Jesus' baptism with Ezekiel's fiery wheel or Isaiah's six-winged serpents. Jesus is down to earth. Even his miracles are quotidian, turning water to wine to save the reputation of a wedding family, healing people society doesn't care about, and providing a catch of fish to men who've been up all night and may not be able to feed their families if they come home empty-handed. Nonetheless, I'm not going to dismiss mystic vision. I mean, it's possible God uses all sorts of weird ways to grab our attention. As Debbie Thomas writes, in what sense are biblically, biblical theophanies real? What role should mystical experience play in our 21st century lives? If God were to appear to us in such dramatic fashion, would we respond with gratitude or fear for our mental health? Then she goes on to question whether such spectacular theophanies are really necessary saying the witness of both scripture and history is consistent in promising us that our God is a God of the encounter. God appears, God speaks, God reveals, and God hears. Our task is not so much to yearn for the cinematic and the spectacular, though I wouldn't rule anything out when it comes to God, but to look for the sacred in the specific details of our lives. Not just in the petty details, but in the messy ones as well, which sounds quite a bit like ordinary miracles or like looking for God in whatever passes for normality around here, though I realize the poem tells us to steer clear of that. 
my question is whether there really is such a thing as normal. For it seems to me Einstein was right. Either everything is a miracle or nothing is. Which is why I showed you the video in the children's talk today. If you look closely, if you pay attention, everything is a miracle. So let's say this is true, or at least a good way to approach the world. What would it mean for how we live our lives? Do we expect gladiolas to burst through Persian rugs and grapefruits to roll in for breakfast? Do we become jaded and disappointed if they don't? No, because we realize it's just as big a miracle that things like gladiolas and Persian rugs exist. It's a blooming gift from God that we're alive and able to enjoy breakfast. It's a wonder we even have breakfast. Do you see where I'm going with this? The real question is not whether miracles exist in life, but whether we're able to see that life itself is a miracle. You may have noticed I haven't yet responded to my earlier question about whether God is accessible or ultimate mystery. Though you might have guessed I'm going to say both. Because this for me is what's so powerful about the incarnational theology of Christianity. In our story, God walked on earth as a human. God knows what it's like to be us. In the theology of incarnation, God is right here in the down and dirty with each one of us at every moment. God is present wherever we look. It's part of the miracle. But there's a God beyond as well. And another theological term describes this, panentheism. Not pantheism, which doesn't distinguish between God and that in which God dwells, rather panentheism, which means God is both within and beyond all creation. This term encompasses both the God within who's accessible and the God that is so unknowable we can't even begin to imagine its reality. The God who's wholly other, ultimately mysterious and frighteningly awesome. The God we don't even begin to understand when we sing holy, holy, holy in a hymn. The God we attempt to tame with our counsels and our creeds and who will forever remain out of reach the God who keeps us humble. And perhaps this both and of God is the reason both ordinary miracles and mystic visions are part of our human experience. Why they're both ways for God to appear. I can appreciate the miracle of an ordinary cup of hot coffee on a cold February morning and I can also yearn for the improbable, the fantastic, the seemingly impossible. I tell you, this was no ordinary rainbow. It stretched low and wide, the spectrum reaching inside the mountain, tickling the tops of trees with indigo and red. I gaped and laughed and leapt. I tell you, it was something, this rainbow, and I took it for a sign. A sign of what, you ask? That nothing is impossible, I answer. That gladiolas can shoot up through a blue Persian rug. That the stars in Orion's belt can join a rhythm and blues band that squirrels can count change at the basketball game and grapefruits as big as bowling balls can roll into the kitchen in time for tomorrow's breakfast. I tell you, this was no run of the mill rainbow. It is with me still. It's promise steering me clear of whatever passes for normality around here. Amen.
Elizabeth is going to share our joys and our concerns. Good morning. It is now the time in our service when we share our deep joys and concerns silently or out loud with God and with one another. I'll share those we've already received this week um, and you're welcome to post any new, um, new joys or concerns in the chat. God, we ask that you hear our healing prayers for Dan's colleague, Carol, who was suddenly hospitalized last week, for Carol P's childhood friend who is diagnosed with colon cancer and is now receiving chemotherapy, for John's sister, Jill, as she con continues her treatment for leukemia, and for Tyler's friend, Heidi, plus strength, patience, and fortitude of spirit for everyone in their family, including caregivers. God, we also ask that you hear our prayers for the family and friend of Carol R's friend, Sharon, who died Friday, for the family and friends of Miriam Collins, who died last week at the age of 103, for the family and friends of Fiona as they grieve her death, for Robin and her mom, Ellie, for the family and friends of Madonna after her death, for finding a way to provide free N95 masks to essential workers, low-income families, and all those who can't afford them or find them. For all of us affected by COVID in whatever way that is. And for anyone anywhere who is sick or grieving or in need. God, we also come before you when we are thankful and have joys. We offer collective thanks for Holly's year as moderator and for all of those who continue to serve our church family. For Dawn's sister's birthday and the beginning of the one month, they are the same age. Um, our family is greatly thankful for our cousin's cancer being stage one and good hopes for infective treatment. For the DC government's efficient and well-organized efforts to provide rapid testing kits to DC residents. Alan's joy that everyone can attend the National Cathedral's even song in person or online today. Oh yes, and Pastor Ellen shares a great joy for our confirmation and COA youth and their mentors. <laughs> Let's take a moment of silence together to hold these joys and concerns and feel free to continue sharing in the chat. Let us pray. Loving God, listen to the prayers of your people we ask that you comfort and nourish us in both our joys and concerns, spoken or unspoken, and hold us tenderly as we face the many different experiences that life and bring, being human bring us each week. Holy and gracious spirit, we are grateful for your presence as we move into this new week, a time that will bring forth both ordinary and exciting miracles, sorrows and joys, and time with one another. Remind us to hold each other in love and prayer, reaching out to the best of our ability, lending a hand, offering support, sending an email or a text, or sharing in celebration. We give thanks for the blessing of this congregation in our lives and pray that each one of us will find a way to be a blessing to others in return when that is our call. In your compassionate name, amen. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I invite you to hold all of these joys and concerns in your heart as we listen to this um, beautiful piece of music. Um, when I was sharing about all of the things that, um, all the celebrations that happened on February 2nd, one that I did not mention that Lisa Jenkins has brought to my attention is that February 2nd is, National Ukulele Day.
Now Callie will share our offertory. This is the time in our service when we receive the offering in grateful appreciation for the life and work of this beloved community. During this time physically apart, all of our regular expenses remain. To support the ongoing work of our church, I ask that you please continue to give via mail or on our website as you are able. The donate link has been put in the chat box if you'd like to give now. And if you have any difficulty, please email John Tishy, our assistant treasurer. He's happy to help out and his email address is also in the chat. I now invite you to take a moment of silence in appreciation for the gift of this church and its many blessings in our lives.
Let us join together in singing the doxology. And so it's now our time for communion. And um, if you would still like to get something to um, some bread or beverage to share during this time, I welcome you to do that. And we haven't for a while, someone pointed out to me, um, shared our words of welcome before communion. Um, I think after we had shared them for a while, I thought, well, we're all clear now that everyone is welcome to the table, um, but we have new folks all the time. And it's really important to make it very clear that all are welcome to the table. And so I share these words adapted from Richard S. Gilbert. Our communion table is open to all and we bid you welcome. We bid you welcome all who come with weary spirit seeking rest. We bid you welcome all who come with hope in your heart. We bid you welcome all who are seekers of a new faith, who come to probe and explore, who come to learn. We bid you welcome all who enter this space as a homecoming, who have found here room for your spirit to find in this people a family. We bid you welcome whoever you are wherever you are on life's journey. We bid you welcome just as you are, just as you are. Please join me in blessing the bread and cup. On the night Jesus ate his last meal, he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, asking that whenever they eat it, they do so in memory of him. On that same night, Jesus took the cup of wine, blessed it, and shared it with his disciples asking that whenever they drink it, they do so in memory of him. And so remembering Jesus, we ask God to bless these gifts of bread and wine. May all who partake of them be filled with the spirit and may they be signs of life and peace for the whole world. If you're at home with others, please share your bread and cup with them as the bread of life, the cup of blessing. If you're physically alone, we're together in spirit and I'll offer my bread and cup and you can eat and drink of your own. The bread of life. the cup of blessing. Please join me for our prayer of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, 
for bringing us together at your table, connected by love wherever we may be. We're grateful to have been reminded once again how much we are loved, and we ask for your help in sharing this love with the world. May we extend the welcome we have experienced here today, everywhere we go and with everyone we meet. And may we be blessed with your creating strength, redeeming grace, and sustaining peace. Amen. Please join me for our closing hymn. This morning, as we go forth, may we know that we are accompanied by an ever-present, if always mysterious God, who reaches out to us in both unexpected and everyday ways. Open our eyes that we may see. Please join me in our sung benediction. Before I begin the postlude, 
Um, I would invite anyone who would like to stay on um, for a little bit after worship to um, unmute and chat. Those of you who are participating in the confirmation coming of age youth and mentor gathering, just a reminder that we are using a different link from worship and I have sent that to you via an email. <laughs> 